morning. How are you? We hope you're doing well. And we're so glad that you joined us for our online lobby. This is fun, right? This is a lot of fun. So I have my coffee. Um, this morning I have community coffee with honey. So let us know in the chat how you're taking your coffee. Are you having coffee with cream? Cream with your coffee? Are you having black coffee? Are you having tea? Or are you having water? That's a way to start your morning. So let us know. Our home team is here hanging out. They want to chat with you. They want to connect. So let us know where you're watching from and what you're up to. So if you're new here, we are so excited that you're here, first of all. And second of all, we want to know. We want to connect with you. We want to chat with you. We want to hang out. So what you can do is leave in the chat, I'm new, and then leave like a cute little confetti popper emoji or two or three because it's fun, you know? Um, the second thing you can do is join us for a virtual connect class. It's going to be happening every month. And it's a class where you can get to know our staff and our leaders and also a lot about the church. So it's a really good place to be. And to join the class, you can email us at connect at iheartchurch.online. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be fun. We hope to see you there. Oh, and speaking of connecting, one, did you know that we have a brand new website? Isn't that very exciting? I think so. Um, so to visit that, it's just iheartchurch.online. So very, very simple. You can do it. This is what it looks like. So you're going to just scroll down and look what you're going to find. Oh, Zoom groups. So basically, we have a fun little video, and you can just click that and play, and it's awesome. We'll show you in a minute. But... You can see that, or you can click Summersville or Mount Hope and Community Campus to find a group that works for you. So I am going to find a group right now. So Mount Hope and Community Campus is where I'm going to look. Um, I'm just going to find something. Let's see, let's see, let's see. Oh, this looks fun. Um, high school girls group with Kinsley and Eden. So I'm just going to text the number that is listed, um, Zoom, and then they'll send me information on how to get connected. So gonna be a lot of fun and I think it's awesome so if you want to dance to a little song and get zoom groups stuck in your head watch this video here's a story of a home church family who were meeting every weekend 
lady friends. All week long they met in church and loved each other, shaking ungloved hands. Till that one day when the whole world went on shutdown, and they couldn't have church or meet in groups. But this church must somehow stay a family. That's the reason they created Zoom Life Groups. Zoom Life Groups. Zoom Life Groups. In the chat right now, I want you to leave some heart emojis and some praying hand emojis for our amazing prayer team. They really are the best in the world. So here's what's been going on. They've been hosting Fasting Fridays. That's just where they're fasting and praying for our city, our state, and for healing. And also you can join the church globally um, with Unite 714. We're just praying at 714 in the morning and 714 in the evening for again, our city, our state, and for healing. To join that, you can just send us an email at amen at iheartchurch.online. Good morning, I hope you're having a great day. In case you didn't know, we have complete kids services online. You can go to our church YouTube channel and click subscribe. You can find all of our kids services from this week to previous weeks. Also, be sure to like us on Facebook and follow us on Instagram at iHeartKidsWV. So just put your kids in a room, you can have big church, they can have little church, and everybody gets some Jesus.
So there have been some awesome outreaches happening over the last few months. We've been able to serve over 20,000 meals, which is amazing. So in the chat, let's leave some praise hand emojis for that because that's awesome and exciting. Um, but if you're wondering how you can get involved in these outreaches, here is a brand new way that you can do that. So go to the App Store or the Google Play Store. I think that's what it's called. So anyway, it's called Serve, and it's a big red app, and it just says Serve across it. So download that, and then type in um, iHeart Church or Mount Hope or West Virginia some way, and you will find iHeart Church West Virginia. So I'm going to try to get this really, really close so you can see. Um, and it just says Meals Outreach. So you're just going to click this fancy little outreach. Can you see that? Can you see that? See that? No, no, no. Well, just take my word for it. Uh, there's a lot of outreaches listed. There's cooking, there's distri distribution team, there's oh, lots of those. There's a delivery team. So there's lots of ways you can get involved and you can just click an outreach that you wanna get involved in and then click add me to the project. So if you have a profile created, it'll alert the team that you wanna join and that's a way you can get involved. Uh, my favorite part about serving on the meals team would have to be the relationships you build with, with the others who are serving with us. You know? side by side, six feet apart. We enjoy serving together. You know, meet people. I've met people through this that, that I didn't know before. So um, that's one of my favorite parts. I probably have two favorite and then, uh, you know, meeting meeting needs in the community um, is definitely a favorite for me. Getting, getting to go out and see people in the community is definitely something I enjoy. But yeah, relationships with other people serving Thank you again for being faithful with your tithe and offering and remind you that it's because of that that we're able to continue to do the outreaches and serve our city. So ways that you can continue to give are through our text to give numbers and those will be listed somewhere on the screen. Um, also through mobile giving that's available on our website iheartchurch.online or through the church app. If you're new here, we are so excited that you're here, first of all. And second of all, we want to know. We want to connect with you. We want to chat with you. We want to hang out. So what you can do is leave in the chat 
I'm new. And then leave like a cute little confetti popper emoji or two or three because it's fun, you know? Um, the second thing you can do is join us for a virtual connect class. It's gonna be happening every month and it's a class where you can get to know our staff and our leaders and also a lot about the church. So it's a really good place to be. And to join the class, you can email us at connect at iheartchurch.online. It's gonna be awesome, it's gonna be fun. We hope to see you there. Oh, and speaking of connecting, one, did you know that we have a brand new website? Isn't that very exciting? I think so. Um, so to visit that, it's just iheartchurch.online. So very, very simple. You can do it. This is what it looks like. So you're going to just scroll down and look what you're going to find. Oh, Zoom groups. So basically, we have a fun little video, and you can just click that and play, and it's awesome. We'll show you in a minute. But... You can see that, or you can click Summersville or Mount Hope and Community Campus to find a group that works for you. So I am going to find a group right now. So Mount Hope and Community Campus is where I'm going to look. Um, I'm just going to find something. Let's see, let's see, let's see. Oh, this looks fun. Um, high school girls group with Kinsley and Eden. So I'm just going to text the number that is listed, um, Zoom, and then they'll send me information on how to get connected. So gonna be a lot of fun and I think it's awesome so if you want to dance to a little song and get zoom groups stuck in your head watch this video here's a story of a home church family who were meeting every weekend making friends all week long they met in church and loved each other shaking ungloved hands till that one day when the whole world went on shutdown they couldn't have church or meeting groups, but this church must somehow stay a family. That's the reason they created Zoom Life Groups, Zoom Life Groups, Zoom Life Groups. That is why you should join a Zoom Life Group.
in the chat right now, I want you to leave some heart emojis and some praying hand emojis for our amazing prayer team. They really are the best in the world. So here's what's been going on. They've been hosting Fasting Fridays. That's just where they're fasting and praying for our city, our state, and for healing. And also you can join the church globally um, with Unite 714. We're just praying at 714 in the morning and 714 in the evening for again, our city, our state, and for healing. To join that, you can just send us an email at amen at iheartchurch.online. Hey parents, good morning. I hope you're having a great day. In case you didn't know, we have complete kids services online. You can go to our church YouTube channel and click subscribe. You can find all of our kids services from this week to previous weeks. Also, be sure to like us on Facebook and follow us on Instagram at iHeartKidsWV. So just put your kids in a room. You can have big church, they can have little church, and everybody gets some Jesus. So there have been some awesome outreaches happening over the last few months. We've been able to serve over 20,000 meals, which is amazing. So in the chat, let's leave some praise hand emojis for that because that's awesome and exciting. Um, but if you're wondering how you can get involved in these outreaches, here is a brand new way that you can do that. So go to the App Store or the Google Play Store. I think that's what it's called. If you have any I'm not sure what I think. So, Anyway, it's called Serve, and it's a big red app, and it just says Serve across it. So download that, and then type in um, I Heart Church or Mount Hope or West Virginia some way, and you will find I Heart Church West Virginia. So I'm gonna try to get this really, really close so you can see. Um, and it just says Meals Outreach. So you're just gonna click this fancy little outreach. Can you see that? Can you see that? See that now? No? No? Well, just take my word for it. Um, there's a lot of outreaches listed. There's cooking, there's distri distribution team, there's oh, lots of those. There's a delivery team. So there's lots of ways you can get involved and you can just click an outreach that you want to get involved in and then click add me to the project. So if you have a profile created, it'll alert the team that you want to join and that's a way you can get involved. Uh, my favorite part about serving on the meals team would have to be the relationships you build with with the others who are serving with us, you know, side by side, six feet apart, 
we enjoy serving together. You know, meet people. I've met people through this that, that I didn't know before. So um, that's one of my favorite parts. I probably have two favorite, and then uh, you know, meeting meeting needs in the community um, is definitely a favorite for me. Getting, getting to go out and see people in the community is definitely something I enjoy. But, yeah, relationships with other people serving. Thank you again for being faithful with your tithe and offering and remind you that it's because of that that we're able to continue to do the outreaches and serve our city. So ways that you can continue to give are through our text to give numbers and those will be listed somewhere on the screen. Um, also through mobile giving that's available on our website iheartchurch.online or through the church app. Thank you again for joining us this morning in the lobby. We have had so much fun hanging out with you. Right? Yes. yes. Everybody? Yeah. Wasn't Everybody. it fun? We had a lot of fun. We all have our coffee. Oh, Kinsley. Kinsley didn't bring her coffee. She'll remember next time. Anyway, thanks again for joining us. Get ready for the message. Church fam, are you guys ready to worship together in the room? And if you're home, worship at home. Come on, let's put our hands together. Step out of the shadows. Step out.
set us for is for freedom, set us free for is for freedom, not so we could be in slavery still. You didn't just pick up another way of life to be in bondage to another, to legalism and another way of, of bondage. He came to set you free. God, thank you so much for your love for us. God, you are the point of living. You are the whole purpose relationship and walking with you. You are the way, the truth, and the life. You came to give us life and life to the fullest. Eternal life starts now. Draw us close to you. Your presence is all I need. It's all I want. All I seek and without it, without it there's no meaning. Your presence is the air I breathe, the song I sing, and the love I need. And without it, without it I'm not living. So I will live 
my defenses and opens the impossible and it's so amazing how you take the ashes and turn them into beautiful take me from where I am into something new I'm giving up control absolutely amazing when I hear that song I think about the body of Christ speaking to God and praying to God in faith saying God take me from where I've been to a place that my mind can't even comprehend take me from 
the regular mundane day-to-day things, Father, and press me into something new. But in order for God to do that for us, we need to be prepared for that. Over the past month or so, God has been speaking something to me over and over and over, and he, he keeps telling me, you're not a grasshopper. In Numbers 13, Moses sent out the people to go over and to scout out the land, the promise that God had, had given to them. And when they went out, they came back with a report. And most of the reports were, we can't do this. There were giants over there and we're like grasshoppers to them and they even looked at us like we were grasshoppers. But there were two bold men of God that were willing to say, let's go out and let's take the land because we don't have to do this of our own strength. But we have a God that's bigger than the giants that we see. God is calling us to go from where we are in our places of comfort. And he's saying, I'm trying to wake up a hope in you. Just trust in me. I want to take you to new levels. I want to take you to new heights. I want to deepen my relationship with you. But you have to put your faith in me. And in that... When they went over to that promised land, they came back with something. They came back with fruit. And the fruit was so huge, so large, that they said the clusters of grapes had to be carried by two men on poles. And what God spoke to me is, the bigger the giant, the bigger the fruit. The harder the trial, the, the, most, the, the more powerful the outcome. So I'm not sure what it is that you've been going through. I know that there's so many different things, but there's two things that I want us to remember. Number one, be careful to who's the report that you're listening to. And number two, the fruit is worth the battle. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to God in prayer. And we're going to ask God to, to wake up that faith that he's placed within us and that we will stir up the gift that he's placed within us so that it can be activated not just for ourselves but for others as well. Let us pray. Dear gracious Father, we thank you for the promise that you've spoken over each and every one of our lives. God, we thank you for speaking life. We thank you for encouraging us, Father, for giving us strength through your word. God, we thank you for the relationship that you've built with us and one another. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus, God, that you would allow us to go forward and capture and take hold of the promise that you've given us, Father, and that we won't see ourselves as grasshoppers any longer, but that we will realize that we are sons and daughters of God, of the Most High God, that they are, that we are women of virtue and men of valor, that we don't have to be afraid, God, because you are for us, and if you be for us, who can be against us? So, Father, we want to give thanks to you in faith saying we appreciate all that you have done, all that you are doing, and all that you will do. We appreciate you and we love you. It's in the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen and amen. Come on, let us celebrate the Lord. Amen, amen. I'm so excited to be here. I'm amped up and uh, ready for the word of God. Uh, but And we, we're so excited that you're here with us, that, that we're here together uh, worshiping God. Our heart, come on, let us welcome all of our campuses that are tuning in. Amen, amen. So what we're going to do is we're going to get ready for the word of God. We'll show, uh, we're going to take a quick break. And after that break, We'll get the word of God, but before we go to take that break, I want you to look to your neighbor and tell them, help me carry the fruit, and we'll be right back.
Come on, come on. We're so glad to have all of you here today, all of you joining in online with us. Come on, are you glad to be in God's house? We got a couple people that are glad. We're so glad. I know we have several uh, homes that have opened up their homes and they have people meeting together there. And uh, I just want to take a second real quick. And all of you uh, who are watching online, I want to ask you guys, please check in. We would love to see who is being able to uh, be reached and touched by uh, the messages and just want to try to keep uh, track of everybody. You know, the, the thing in Luke chapter 15 when uh, the shepherd uh, had a hundred sheep, he realized one of them was lost. The only way that he could do that was to see them and count them. And unfortunately, we are in a crazy time where right now you can see me, I'm sorry for that, but I can't see you. And so the one way that I can see you is if you check in. And so in all of our formats, whether it's YouTube or Facebook or in the church online, if you are watching, fill out that form. If you have families that are watching with you, make sure you put their names. I think it has a, a thing of how many are attending and, and the other families that are attending with you. That way we can just kind of keep track of, of who is joining in and, and uh, reach out to people. And we're just so glad uh, that you guys as a church have been so faithful to watch online, uh, to share videos. I know last week's sermon was probably one of our most shared videos that we've ever had and has been viewed. And, uh, and, and then the, the conversation that Melody had on, on Wednesday night with Mercy, I know that has been shared and a lot of people are seeing that. And I think that those are some messages that really need to continue to be shared uh, because those are conversations that we all need to have and to hear, amen? And, and again, I just wanna thank uh, Pastor Jonathan and Pastor Aaron uh, for being willing last week to come up here. Uh, you know, it is not a, an easy thing to preach on a subject that you really know that, you know, no matter what you say, that there's a potential of somebody being upset with you. And I didn't even want to just take a second for that. I am so grateful that so many of you uh, that have questioned or uh, had, you know, something that was said may have kind of made you think something. I'm so grateful that you were mature enough to reach out and ask further questions. And that's what this is all about. That if there is something that you don't understand, to have the maturity to have a follow-up conversation and get some clarity there. And, uh, you know, we've been getting texts and phone calls just asking questions, and we're not afraid of questions. Uh, we opened the conversation, and we said, we're going to continue this, and uh, and it's a two-part. So you've heard from us, and I and, uh, thank some of you for uh, talking to us and letting us hear from you. We love you guys and can't wait until all of this craziness is gone and we're just able to come together in God's house and worship together. But until then, continue to check in online, continue to join together in homes and, and register to come out to services. So glad to see some smiling faces here tonight. And uh, we are going to start a new series. Uh, the the uh, series that we're in is called The Greatest of These is love or the greatest is love. And so we're gonna dive in. Come on, let's pray before we get into the word of God. And, and we're gonna dive into this new series. Father God, we just thank you God for this day. God, we thank you for those who are able to join together here, those that would join together in all of our campuses on Sunday, God, Lord, in Summersville and in the community campus and, and in Mount Hope, God. And, Lord, we thank you for those that are joining in in their home with groups and, and others around and those that are tuning in by themselves. Father, uh, I thank you that your presence is not limited to one location, God. That, that Father, when Jesus said it is finished, that the veil that held back the presence of God and kept it in the Holy of Holies was torn from top to bottom and made a way for everybody, no matter where we are, God, to experience your presence. And Father, I pray that they are already experiencing your presence through worship. And as we dive into your word, I pray that you will speak to us, God. Lord, that we will hear your word. And God, that it would change our lives forever. 
in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. And so, as I said, we are going to start a series called The Greatest is Love. And we're going to look at this over the next three or four weeks. And, and we actually, a couple of these scriptures we uh, talked about a couple of weeks ago, one of them is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. And when we were talking about the social media posts, this was one of the filters that, that I asked you guys to run things through. And it says this, let all, come on, say that with me, say all. That means the things you say, the things you post, the, the attitudes that you carry, your responses, let all things that you do be done in love. And then we talked about the fact that Paul defined love in this same letter in 1 Corinthians 13 and in verse 4. It says that love is patient, that love is kind, it is not jealous, Love does not brag and it is not arrogant. In other words, it doesn't think that it, kno that, that it knows everything and there's nothing that it can learn. And, and I think it's very important in the day and time that we are in that we are not arrogant, but that we walk in great humility. Can I get an amen? Because there's none of us that know everything. There's all of us, we have things that we can learn. It says it does not act un becomingly it does not seek its own it is not provoked and it doesn't take into account the wrongs that have been suffered there is so much we can stop right there and just preach that scripture and stay there for an entire thing but I want to go on down after he defines what love is in verse 13 he kind of wraps up this thought he said now there is faith and there is hope and there is love these three abide, but the greatest of these is love. And so we're going to look at why Paul said that the greatest of these is love. And when you think about love, we're, if, if you have your Bible, you can open up to John chapter 8 because that's where we're going to flip over to because I believe there's a story that uh, God just showed me over the weekend. Actually, it was in, in a situation where uh, somebody was a little frustrated with some of the things that were said or some of the things that were posted and, and we're kind of asking a lot of questions. And, and uh, so as, as these questions are being asked, I'm just praying and asking God how to answer some of those questions. And this story comes to mind and so I, I wasn't the one that was engaging in the conversation. They were talking with another uh, person in the church, and, and they were asking me, you know, how do I answer this? How do I even respond to the questions that they are asking? And, and, and you know, just kind of working through those things themselves. And all of a sudden, this story came to mind. And so I just kind of type in my answers based on this story. And then once I got done with that, I walked over and just started typing in more and more and more notes. And literally the confrontation is what this entire sermon series uh, has been birthed out of. It, it, it really has been like a direct download from God uh, as to a word and a message for God's people. And in John chapter eight, I believe that this story shows us uh, one of the ways that love is so important and why the greatest of these is love. And, and I'm gonna give you three things tonight as to why the greatest is love. The first one is this, is that love brings life. Come on, how many of you have had teenagers or younger kids and you've had to have some of those difficult conversations? Well, when a man loves a woman and they fall in love, then they get married, and after they get married, I'm not going through all the details, parents. I'm not going, you don't have to turn it off, and you don't have to be like, hey, kids, listen up, because I don't want to have to have this conversation. I'm making you have it. When they get married, then God gives them babies later. So the love equaled, you know, set up marriage, and then, then came the baby carriage. Come on, you know, the, the, the uh, Jonathan and Galicia sitting in a tree, K-I-S-S-I-N-G. First comes love, then comes marriage, then comes Jonathan pushing a baby carriage. Come on, somebody. 
You know, that, I mean, that's the little song that we know how things work. Love brings life. And when you look at, uh, in John chapter 10, we see a scripture that really shows that God's love and Jesus' love for us, that the, the desired fruit from his love was life. In, in John chapter 10, Jesus starts talking about how he is the shepherd and, and he's there for the sheep. And, and in verse 10, he says, listen, the thief comes and he comes only to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I have come. So the reason why that I left my throne room in heaven to come down to earth, I have come because I want you to have life and I want you to have it abundantly. I loved you so much that I didn't want to leave you in a position where you truly couldn't live. So my love is there to bring life. In other words, Jesus is basically saying one of my mission statements for my ministry, because you, you know every ministry has their mission statement or every business has their vision statement, all that stuff. This is kind of like Jesus' mission statement that he says here, I, I came to bring life. I came to not just bring life where you exist, but I came to bring an abundant life where you thrive. And you think about that, that Jesus came and he went to the cross and he died on a cross for our sins so that we, and we, we went through the whole thing about how our spirit comes to life when we receive him into our life and he, he brings forth new spiritual fruit. But he doesn't only give what his mission statement is, he also gives the enemy's mission statement. He says, I have come so that you can have life, but there is an enemy, there is a thief and what he has come to do is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. The enemy comes to bring death. The enemy comes to bring hopelessness. The enemy comes to try to destroy life. And so a lot of times we look at the battle in between God and Satan as good versus evil. But this verse, Jesus kind of puts it this way. It's not just good versus evil, it's life versus death. And it has always been that way, even from early on, if you go to the Old Testament, when, when they had, uh, uh, when Moses was bringing the Israelites out of, out of Egypt and out of bondage, in Deuteronomy chapter 28, he told them, he said, listen, I have set before you life and death. Choose life so that you may live. You know what that shows us? That life is not consequences of circumstances that we have no control over. That no matter where you grew up, whether you were rich or poor, no matter the color of your skin, no matter what religious background or lack of background that you may have, that life is something that God gives before us as a choice. And Jesus said, my, my mission statement is I want to bring life where I go. And as the body of Christ, our mission statement should be the same that Jesus said, that we want to bring life to whatever situation that we're in. Wherever we go, our goal is not to defeat the enemy as in a person, but our goal is to bring life into the situations that, we're, that we encounter in our life. The second reason why the greatest is love is because not only does life, love bring life, but love fights for life. And this is what we see in John 8. This is a familiar story we're going to pick up in verse 3. It says, the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who was caught in the very act of adultery. Now, for those who are old enough and mature enough to know what adultery is, come on, it takes more than one person to commit adultery, okay? But here in this situation, the Pharisees weren't concerned with the man in the issue, 
because in all likelihood, probably one of the Pharisees was the man in the issue. So they bring this woman in front of Jesus and they said, they set her in the center of the court. And they said, teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. And I'm sure they didn't walk into the room and say, okay, get dressed, do your makeup and your hair, get ready because we're gonna go before Jesus right now. And we're gonna have a conversation to see what Jesus thinks about the way that you live. She was dragged out of the situation into the public court in front of everybody. She's in a position where she's hurt, she's broken, she feels betrayed by the person, she feels set up, she feels exposed and everything. And, and, and they're bringing it in front of everybody and then in front of Jesus, who is a, like a rabbi and a teacher among the Jewish faith, and then they look at Jesus and they said, the law of Moses has commanded us that we're supposed to stone such a woman. What then do you say about this? And then you, John, I love it because a lot in John, he, he kind of he, he kinda fills in the gaps in case you didn't realize what they're trying to do here. <laughs> he gives some commentary here. He, he's like, they weren't saying this because they really cared about what Jesus had to say. They were saying this because they were testing him so they might find grounds to accuse him. And it says that Jesus just stooped down and he began to write some things in the dust on the ground. Now I want you to think about this because I think there's some very important things here because it really relates to what happens in the world that we have today is these people didn't like Jesus, right? Pharisees didn't like Jesus. They wanted to try to trip him up and they were looking at a way to try to find a way to discredit him. And so they set up this situation and bring her at his feet all because they want to expose something in Jesus. Now, this sounds a whole lot like what people do on social media today. <laughs> yeah, I'm going right back to social media. You literally have people, and especially now that coronavirus, you know, there's still some things that are shut down. There's people that aren't working and things. They have a whole lot more free time. They are literally on social media just scrolling through posts to find somebody who doesn't agree with them so that they can lash out at them, so they can try to expose them, so they can try to trip them up. And sometimes they even do it in such a way that they ask a simple question knowing that if I can get them to say something, I'm going to get a lot of people angry at them. If I can get them to say the wrong thing. And so you know what happens? Because there are people who are out there looking to cause a stink, then sometimes people are afraid to say nothing, and it feeds the perpetual thing that we talked about last week of racism and black people not feeling heard. Now everybody's getting quiet on me again. Why can't we get off this? Because this is the world we're living in right now. And the word of God is living and active and it's for, it gives us instructions for life and for godliness. This is exactly what you're supposed to be doing when there's situations that everybody in the world is facing. Because it, even in, in the sports world, forget the church world, let's, let's go to the sports world. You look in things like on ESPN and things and you see how Black athletes are upset because some of these white owners in the, in the NBA have not made any public statements to this thing. But here's why. I want to explain the other side of it. They're afraid to.
Guys, I can tell you this. There is such a fear of if I say the wrong thing, somebody might get mad. So it's better for me to say nothing. And then it, the enemy doesn't stop saying what he says. He goes and says, see, by them saying nothing, they're saying that they agree with that. And it starts this whole crazy cycle. And if we can just begin, the reason why we've had so many conversations, we keep talking about this is because if we expose one revelation, if somebody gets one revelation out of each conversation, then we can move one step closer because the enemy wants polarization over here, over here. I don't like you, you don't like me. And wants to cause a fight and a battle among each other when really we're all fighting for the same thing. We're fighting for the lives, okay? People who have friends and family members who are police officers are saying blue lives matter because they're fighting for the lives of the police officers who are doing good, who aren't the evil people. People who are say, you know, saying black lives matter, it's the same thing. They're saying that, that our life matters. By, and, and what the enemy wants you to think is that by saying blue life or black life matters, that you have to choose one. But I'm telling you this, I refuse to choose one because Jesus didn't choose one. Jesus chose the fact that every life matters, whether it's white or black, whether they're a sinner or a saint, that every single life matters. And we have to realize the enemy, the tactic that he is using to try to draw a division among the people and especially within the races and things. I tell you right now, Pastor Jonathan's life matters to me. But on the other side of it, Pastor Aaron's life matters to me and I will not choose one or the other and God doesn't want us to choose one or the other. He wants us to be on Jesus's team that I have come to give life. My mission statement is to bring life and he wants us, to, instead of engaging in all this, he wants us to bring life wherever we go. And can I just tell you something? Listen, I, you're not going to win any battles in social media, okay? The best thing you can do is have conversations with people who see the other side like we did last week but then take the information that you gather from having a conversation with people who see the other side and share it with people who don't see that side. And I think that that's one thing that we've been hearing is people have just been saying, I never saw it. I just never, I ne I never realized it. I never understood that side of it. But if the enemy can't get us to choose sides, then what he does is he tries to get us if he can't get us just to take a life, he'll try to get us to belittle a life. To justify the taking of a life. And that's exactly what the Pharisees are doing with Jesus in this situation. They're saying, this woman, this sinner was caught in adultery. Moses said that we could take her life what do you want me to do? do you, you want to join in on throwing the stones and take the life? Or are you going to say something different than what Moses says? What the, they're painting the picture of this sinner woman's life is invaluable. It's not, it's not worth anything. It's, 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 she's just a prostitute. So can we just go ahead and start throwing stones now? And this is something that the enemy has used throughout time. And the, the psychological term for this is called cognitive dissonance. I know Mercy talked about this a little bit. Cognitive dissonance occurs when 
you have two thoughts or cognitions going on in your brain, and they're in conflict with one another. So let me give you a non-confrontational type illustration. Hopefully, you won't throw stones at me for this one, but just think about it in this way. You know and have been taught that cigarettes can cause cancer, that cigarettes can cause emphysema, that cigarettes have a lot of negative effects. effects. They can hurt your heart. There's a lot of things. But knowing all of those factors, there's still a lot of people who smoke cigarettes. Why? Because in their mind, they know the health risks, but they excuse it because, well, my grandfather smoked cigarettes and he lived to be 98 years old. My, I, I still can, I'm still in better shape than what a lot of people are who don't smoke cigarettes. I, uh, I can quit anytime that I want to. Like that, but, but all my friends are doing it, kind of peer pressure thing. There's like all these different reasons why. And so there's this conflict in between that they have. And so in order to continue to do the things such as smoking cigarettes, you have to convince yourself in your mind that it's okay. And it's in cases like this that, that the dissonance that you create in that battle, that it leads you to make a decision that even could potentially be harmful. Now let's take that into what it looks like in life. Let's go back to what happened during the days of the Holocaust. What did they do? They literally would draw pictures and put out things that Jews are just like rats. They belittled them. They're, 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 they're like a virus. It's just going to spread among us. We're a superior race, and we need to get rid of these rats. We need to get rid of, of these people. They don't see things the way that we do. They, they, they painted that picture. Have you ever thought how an entire nation could let one man end up killing millions of Jews? How could the church not say anything in this time? And there's even stories, I think Melody used it in her Arise message, that, that we would, that this church that is on the side where the railroad tracks were, where the Jews are being packed into these railroad carts, and, and like there's 200 people crammed into a little bitty room, and they're, they're tra- put on a train to go hours down, and, and, and as, as the trains would go by, the people would be in their church services, and they would hear these Jews screaming out and crying out for help and somebody help us and everything and it says they asked how could you deal with that and the people in the church said we just sang a little louder so that we wouldn't hear it they just justified it and guys That's exactly what has happened in our country. Listen, we have to realize, I told you guys last week that we are not fighting a physical battle. We are fighting a spiritual battle. And this spiritual battle has been far before our country was ever a country. And even in our country's documents that are supposed to be declaration of independence and freedom, In the Constitution in 1787, they did what was known as a three-fifths compromise. Do you know what a three-fifths compromise is? Some of y'all do, some of y'all, uh-uh. A black slave wasn't a man. They were three-fifths of a human. And during this time, as they're painting the picture, this person is three-fifths of the human. They're also portraying African-Americans as being apes and coming from apes and all of these things. So now, not only are they just three-fifths of a man, but they're also an animal. What are they doing? They're dehumanizing them. Why? Because the white man couldn't own and beat and treat black men and women the way that they did without a cognitive dissonance. If you convince me that they're not human, 
If you convince me that they're not like me, then I won't harm them. I won't own them that way. And so these white people justified, and it's like this mass cognitive dissonance thing of they're not, they're, they're just like an animal. So the same, they're, they're no different than my donkey or my horse or or any other thing that I use to work my fields and and to to, to uh, you know take care of my farm and and all of those things. And so if I'd beat my horse, then I can beat my slave. If I would sell one of my horses, or if I would sell one of my animals, because then then I can sell my my slave's wife or my slave's children because it doesn't matter. It's just like, you know, it, like with us today, if if our dog has a puppy, we don't just keep all the puppies. We're, we're okay with separating the puppy from the family because it's just an animal. It doesn't know any better. And it created a culture. And you can go look it up. 1787, in the Constitution the three-fifths compromise. You know what that does? It creates a mentality. And listen, guys, we, we, we count black people as a whole person today, so we've made progress. <laughs> but we do the same thing in our world today. It's not a baby, it's a fetus. I figure if I'm going to mess with things and get everybody mad at me, let me just stir the pot all the way up. Let's, it's just a fetus. It's just a combination of cells. And people have accepted that to the tune of 60 million babies being killed, partially born, tubes stuck in the back of the head, suck out the brain, break the baby apart. And where states over the past few years have passed, you know what, all the way up to birth, it's start started with it's just a fetus you can't tell me my daughter was born at 36 weeks and she lived I, I, I one was born at 36 one at 37 one at 38 one at 39 and every one of them came out fully human sort of they may have acted like animals every now and then but they were human And now today, we've accepted it where that border has just been pushed farther and farther and farther, even up to the point of the day you are set to deliver. That baby can be delivered that any other day, even by their law of it took a breath and it is alive, that it used to be, that baby can be ripped apart and killed. We can sit there and we can look at the Jews or look at the Germans about how many millions of people that they had and allowed to be killed and they just sang a little louder. But where are we? Over 60 million in our country. Because we've been convinced certain groups and certain things it's not worth, it's not a life worth having, saving. You know, we, what, the baby might have been born handicapped. You know what, I have a handicapped niece. And if any of my nieces are listening, just plug your ears for a second. That girl is my favorite niece. I love that little girl. I mean, she's probably about 20 years old now. And I can tell you, her parents it's, a, it's not an inconvenience for them. That's their baby girl. That's my niece. But guys, even as soon as George Floyd lost his life, There were people trying to justify about why it was okay. He had drugs in his system. He had he had committed a crime. He was a he had criminal acts before. He's just a drug addict. You know what?
everybody looked at this woman and said, she's just a prostitute. Let's stone her. And Jesus is like, no, 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 I'm not going to do that. We have got to stop allowing the enemy to get us to devalue people's lives based on what profession they have, what color of skin they have, what income level they have, what struggle they may be battling with right now, or any other affiliation that they may have in their life. Jesus valued all lives the same. Listen, the price for a pastor's life to be saved was Jesus' death on the cross. The price for a prostitute's life to be saved. Guess what? He paid the same price. Jesus' death on a cross. The price for a black man, the price for a police officer, it's all the same. The blood of Jesus Christ was the price that he paid for us all. He didn't devalue any life. He didn't go try to get a two-for-one special from the enemy on a prostitute or a drug addict. That life isn't good enough, so... I'll pay a cheaper price for them. No, he said, I am all in in bringing life. And I don't care where they came from. I don't care what they look like. I don't care how much money they have. I love them and I want to bring life and I want them to have life more abundantly. And that is the call of the church. The other thing that Jesus did was he didn't associate people with a group. He looked at the individual. He didn't let them look at her as just an adulteress. He looked at her and he saw a hurting, scared woman. He stopped at a well and he waited for a Samaritan woman that everybody else criticized and looked down upon. He went to a tree to a tax collector that everybody else didn't want anything to do with. And he said, hey, Zacchaeus, I want you to come on down because I'm going to come. Not only am I going to come have a conversation with you, but I'm going to get in your world. I'm going to come and eat dinner at your house today. And it said because he did that, Jesus didn't even have to preach a message. The minute that he showed Zacchaeus love, he said, listen, if I have wronged anybody, then I'm going to pay them back, and I'm going to give money to the poor and and everything. I mean, the instant that he encountered love, why is the greatest of these love? It's because love is the thing that breaks down ethnic culture. It breaks down uh, denominational barriers. It breaks down every barrier that you can think of from age to 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 uh, the income level and all the things in between. Jesus stood by people that a lot of times the church wouldn't want any part of it because we generalize groups of people based on their actions that they have you know, Pastor Aaron talked about how a lot of times a, a police officer or even, even a black man brings in their last encounter into the encounter that they have with that individual at that point. What is that? It's a generalization that because this person treated me that way this time, then all of them are going to treat me that way. And Jesus refused to generalize people. He spoke to the individual and he let the individual's life speak for itself. He looked at the fruit of that person's life. He looked past all of these things. Guys, we have got to stop saying things like those people, us and them. We've got to realize what the enemy's doing. He's dividing. Why? Because a house, a kingdom, a nation divided cannot stand. It dies. It crumbles. If the enemy can divide us, he can destroy us. We can't, allow, we can't be a part of the devaluation of life. We can't and look at one person and because one person treated us this way, automatically think that everybody is going to treat us this way. And guys, there's another side to the story. We, we've talked a lot about the side of the story and perspective of, from the African-American side because we've got a lot of white people in our church and they need to understand that 
racism isn't something that people just came up with and made up, and it's not a political thing. It's not all these things. It's something that still exists, and I believe that God has really used that to open people's eyes. But I, I have looked into the eyes of many police officers and things and saw the same fear that I've looked into the eyes of my black brothers and sisters and seen in their heart and in their lives. And what everybody wants to do is you got to pick a group. And if one's bad, they're all bad. And I just want to speak to this and I'll get off of it. But there's a movement to defund police officers. There's a movement to get rid of all of them. And I'm telling you that is straight from the pits of hell. Because the minute that they come off the streets is the minute that people will go into doing things. I mean, we are completely unaware. I was listening to a pastor speak about how he went on a ride along one night. And in that one night, there were 10 to 15 domestic violence uh, things that that police officer had to go into these situations and handle. That if, if there is not law enforcement that is protecting us on the highway, look, I'm telling you, if the, one of the big things that keep people afraid of drunk driving and everything is afraid that there's going to be a law enforcement officer pulling them over. We need them. And you cannot sit there and defund the hundreds of thousands of police officers who are doing right because there's a few bad apples. In the same way that we have looked into our, our black friends and, and things eyes and said, listen, I stand with you. I love you. I support you. Listen, we need to do the same thing with our police officers. And there is change taking place from different body armor cameras that are there, from, from being more enforcing on the amount of force that can be used. There are things that are progressing in the right direction, and we need to give time, a little bit of things to, to where we can weed out the bad ones and, get, and keep the ones that are there for the right reason. I can tell you this. Look, I have offered Aaron Wood a job three or four times to come on staff at the church and not have to put himself in harm's way and see the things that he sees. And every single time he has told me, I can't do it because I am called to do this. I feel like I can make a difference. And I know that there are many others. There are police officers that are in our church that had an easier position that are going back onto the streets because they want to be there to try to bring peace. They want to be there to try to calm things down and we need to support them. We don't need to choose one or the other. We need to hold each individual accountable for what they've done, not lump them into a group. And by embracing some, it doesn't mean that you are condoning or saying that what a few have done is right. Loving and accepting people, this is the third thing, and uh, keys can come up. Loving and accepting people does not mean that you condone their actions. You look at the end of the story after Jesus got down and he knelt and he wrote down in the dirt and the sand. Verse 10 says he straightened up and he looked at this woman and he said, woman, where, where are your accusers? Did no one condemn you? She said, no one, Lord. And look at what Jesus said. He said, listen, I don't condemn you either. I know what the law says. The law says that I should pick up stones and throw them at you. But I didn't come to bring death. I came to bring life. And the sin of adultery is not one that I stand for or agree with. But I see your life and I love you enough to give you a second chance at life. And 
now on, go and sin no more. You got to think about this. This woman probably had been in the arms of a whole lot of men. But she never felt love like what Jesus just gave her. It didn't cost her her dignity. It didn't. She didn't have to compromise herself to receive that love. Jesus gave her that love. And the same way that when they encountered the love of God, Zacchaeus encountered the love of God, it just flipped his life completely all around. One encounter with true love saved her life and changed her life. And she went on from that encounter completely different. What if we could be those vessels of love? That when we find somebody that's hurting, whether it's a police officer or a black man, a drug addict or a prostitute, even somebody who's just been in the church playing the religious game, because there's plenty of them, that we can show them that true love. And in fact, That's what Jesus commanded us to do, not suggested. In John 13, at the Last Supper, Jesus is with his disciples in verse 34. He says, a new commandment I'm giving you today. This is the commandment that I have, that you attend church every single Sunday and you read from the Torah every day. You spend at least three hours in prayer is that what he said? Like, those are all good things to do. It's good to be in church every Sunday. It's good to... He said, I want you guys to continue the work that you've seen me do. And I want you to love one another as I've loved you. And then he goes one step farther. And he said, by this, by your love, all men, Say that word, say all. This is some of you that are watching this, you need to know that Jesus came so that you could experience his love. Because people in the church have looked down on you because of your divorce. People in the church have looked down on you because of your tattoos. People in the church have looked down on you because the multiple divorces and the past sin that you've been in. You need to know this. Jesus loves you. And just like the woman caught in adultery, just like the tax collector who had swindled all this money just like the Samaritan woman who had had multiple husbands and was living with somebody who wasn't their husband at that time. He set up this moment to encounter you right where you are. And that love that changed all of their lives, that Samaritan woman ran back to her city. All the people that she was trying to avoid and said, you got to come see this man because he told me everything I've ever done. This is the son of God. And I said, the entire city came and Jesus stayed there. And the Jews and the Samaritans were every bit as intention and everything as, as whites and blacks are in our country today with racism and stuff. And Jesus didn't care about it. He stayed among the Samaritans for a couple more days. And it says that many of those people came to believe in him. Why did they believe? Because he didn't care that they were Samaritans and he was a Jew. Because he didn't care about any of their pasts. He just loved them. And he wanted to offer them life. And that's why Paul said the greatest of these is love. Listen, Paul was a Pharisee. Paul was killing 
Christians until he encountered the love of Jesus. This isn't just about people in the world needing to feel love. There's people in the church who play the religious game and they know how to shout amen and they know when to say what they're supposed to say and how brother how art thou today and glory hallelujahs and everything but inside they're dead because all they've had is a form of religion and Jesus loves you enough to say the same way that I knocked Paul off the horse and encountered him and allowed him to encounter the love and it changed his life forever there's too many people that are playing this religious game that I believe that there's a revival that God wants to do among the people that people already think are clean and all put together that there's a bunch of religious people that Jesus came to set them free from the religion and let them encounter relationship with a loving God. It's love. Why is love the greatest thing? Because the word of God says in 1 John 4, 8, God is love. Love. I heard a pastor say today that if people don't feel like God exists anymore, it's because God's people haven't been showing him in the way that they love others. And there's a lot of people who don't believe that God exists. There's a lot of people who don't believe that Christians, and they think they're just a bunch of hypocrites and everything. But if we can show them love, no matter what background they have, no matter what possession, profession they have, no matter what color skin they have, just love people. That's why if you've gone through Connect class, one of the things that we've said is our mission statement as our church is we want to reflect God's love to people. That's, that's our heart. Because that's where change can come place, take place. People can be set free. Take somebody who's a prostitute, make them a full-time follower of Jesus like that. Take somebody who's killing the church and make them stand up and write half the Bible. <laughs> two-thirds of the New Testament. That's what our God can do. We can't be afraid to demonstrate that love. Because that's the most powerful weapon that we have. That's the mission statement of Jesus. To love people, to bring them there. I want you to bow your heads just for a second. I want you to do a self-evaluation. your reactions in the season and the times that we're in, are they showing people that you're a disciple of Jesus? Are your responses to people, are they showing love or are they showing anger and frustration? And we talked about this last night that James said, the, or last week that James said that the anger of God has never produced the righteousness of man. And if you feel that anger on the inside, then I am begging you, get off of social media, stop listening to all of the junk that's feeding that. Begin to get in the word of God, get in the presence of God. Start feeding your spirit with sermons and truth so that we can bring forth the life that God has. Father God, I just come to you, Lord. We need you. God, I know, I know I have failed at demonstrating love. God, I know that, that there's been times that I've responded in anger or offense. God, I just ask for me that you forgive me. Because God, I know any door that I open in my life that it flows down among our church. And God, I ask that it just starts in me, Father God. Any wrong thoughts. God, I pray as David prayed in Psalms 139, test my heart and try my thoughts, God. 
If there's anything in me that's not of you, Father, I pray you eliminate it, God. Let me be a vessel of love. Because that love brings life. God, I pray for our church. We demonstrate your love to every person that we come in contact with. That we're on mission. God, that it's not just a mission statement that's on our website, but God, it's who we are. God, let us love people who are different than us. Let us love people that the enemy wants to point as being against us, God. Let us refuse to throw stones at one another, God, because we value that person's life. stand our feet. We're going to go back in to that breakthrough song, and I want you to start at the very beginning. I want to go through the verses. Because this song talks about taking me someplace I've never been before. In order to take me beyond my familiar shores and take me someplace I've never been before, it means that there's going to have to be a mindset change that's in us. If we truly want to see a breakthrough and not feel all this heaviness and all of this discouragement and all of this depression and all of this anger and all of those things, the only way that we're going to experience a breakthrough is if we allow God to break through the mess and the junk that is in our hearts and begin to deal with us. And it, it, it breaks my heart because there's so many people that I've had these conversations with and they'll sit there and say, yes, I agree. I agree. You're right. You're right. But, and then everything they say after the but just eliminates everything that they just said that they agreed with. Look, I preached a message series a few years ago called, We Gotta Get Off Our Butt, B-U-T. And we are at the place where we have to get off of our butt because it doesn't matter what comes after the word but. All that is is a justification and an excuse to stay where we have always been. We can't sing a song and say, God, take me to a new place. Let me experience breakthrough. Let me see revival and miracles take place. But I want to do it my way, God. I want to hold on to all my wrong thoughts. That's why it says in Romans that you have to renew your mind. And then you will prove what is good and the acceptable and the perfect will of God. If you want the will of God to be performed in our life, if we want the will of God to be performed in this church, it's not going to come by the things that we have always known. It's going to come when we change our mind to what God's Word says. And God's Word says that I have come to bring life and life more abundantly. I didn't come to throw stones. I didn't come to condemn people. I came to give my life for people. I came to seek and to save that which was lost, not point and judge those that are lost. Tired of playing church? We gotta be the church. If you're watching in your homes, don't turn this off. Because if you turn this off, everything I've said doesn't matter. This is the portion where we say, God, I hear what you're saying, and I want it to be done in my life. And we commit ourselves. And I want to be a part of that breakthrough. Come on, let's just begin to worship God. There must be more beyond familiar shores. Into water, sun, explore this one desire that's stirring here in me. Deep is calling out to deep. Take me from where I am into. Sleep. 
something new. I'm giving up control. I need a breakthrough. All of my dreams and fears crashing into you. You're waking up my hope. You want my breakthrough. Come breakthrough. Your love so my defenses it opens the impossible and it's so amazing how you take the ashes and turn them into beautiful take me from where I am into something I'm giving up control I need to break through all of my dreams The, the breakthrough in my life and likely yours was love. It wasn't clever words or fancy speech. It, it was love. And some of you have been asking for breakthrough and some of you are looking for breakthrough. And I will just tell you, 
our pastor shared with us the truth of the word of God tonight, today, that, that, that we just need love. We need to receive God's love and we need to share that love with others. I'm so thankful that we had the opportunity to worship together. It's great to be together. Uh, if you're joining us online, I just want to remind you that you have an opportunity to give. Also, be sure to check in for those of us that are here. Isn't it great to be in God's house? Was that a good word? To, was that a good word? Amen. Listen, go in peace. Be blessed.